Well, hi there for my subscribers. Thanks again for your continued support and subscription. I value it very much. This will be the video where I answer some of your questions about Jesus and Christology. So first of all, we've got a question from Josh. Uh, Joshua asks, how did the divinity and humanity relate within Jesus? Oh, that's a big question. Um, as in, a human baby has a limited memory and capability, and so he surely couldn't have been omnipotent at this point. Was he omnipotent at some point later than that? Would he have understood physics? Like uh, he could have used the image of faith as small as an atom in his drafts and then contextualized to a mustard seed, or was his omnipotence limited in some way? Uh, I know that's a massive question. Josh, big understatement there. Uh, question two. Uh, Jesus only had a ministry after being filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. In this symbolic, is this symbolic to give us an image of needing the Spirit for our ministry, or is this magnifying his humanity at the expense of his divinity? I know that the second part of the question is probably considered heretical by a council, but forgive me, still an undergrad. Uh, well, Josh, yeah, these are some big questions, and they're related to what is the nature of Jesus' humanity, and how did it relate to his divinity. And the genuine church consensus is Jesus has two natures. They're not mixed together, but they're not fully partitioned away either. Uh, they are unmixed, but they are united. And this, this is the meaning of the phrase hypostatic union. So what we would normally say would be something like, yes, Jesus in his humanity, he had to learn how to talk. He had to learn uh, how to do basic daily chores. He had to learn how to read and write. His divinity did not overpower his humanity. And, he, and you know, he, he was a human being. And if he wasn't a human being, if he didn't fully participate in all the steps and stages of human life, then he could not really identify with us and be our redeemer. Uh, how, has, has, how that relates to his divinity I think is, is, is a bit more uh, complex, but you could argue that his uh, divinity, you know, perhaps laid something like uh, present, but dormant as an active ability. So he wasn't able to draw on that. And even throughout his life, you, you, you see the same thing happening. You know, when Jesus says, nobody knows the day or even the hour, neither the angels nor the son of man. I think he's speaking there about in his humanity, he does not know certain things. Uh, that there are some traditions, um, like I think the Infancy Gospel of Thomas portrays the child Jesus as something of a religious prodigy, uh, and he's able to give symbolic interpretations of the letters of the, I think it's the Greek alphabet, uh, but Orthodox Christianity has never, never gone that route. On Jesus receiving the Spirit, I, I can be a bit more specific like that. Uh, Jesus never does things out of his own power. Uh, he only does things in obedience to his heavenly father and through the Holy Spirit. And that, that underscores, if you like, the somewhat Trinitarian nature of Jesus' life. He acts not of his own uh, mission or volition, but he acts in subjugation or submission to the father, I should say, and in the power of the spirit. And in fact, you could argue that the spirit is, is more of the dominant relationship, the dominant uh, person in that relationship guiding and pressing Jesus to do things like the spirit compels him to go into the wilderness or the spirit um, uh, drives and empowers his, his preaching mission. So, certainly in the case in the gospel of Luke, that's what you get. But uh, yeah, Josh, um, some uh, props to you for asking one of the most difficult questions, how do the divine and human natures of Jesus relate? And hey, for all I know, I may have committed some heresy in there somewhere. Next question from Stanton. What do you think about writers portraying Jesus as playful? How could Jesus as a human not know what his divinity would have most certainly known? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that, that depends what you mean like that. Do you mean like Jesus is just playing dumb or saying like he doesn't know things? And you can say like, well, in his humanity, he does not know everything. In his humanity, he is not omnipotent. I mean, he sweats. Um, he has tiredness, he even grieves in, in his humanity. And there is a sense where you have, you have to go what I would call a, a, a miniature Nestorianism, okay? Uh, and that's where you say the two natures are not mixed together. They are united, but they are separate. And there are things that are true of his humanity that are not true of his uh, divinity. 
I hope that's that's answered what you're asking about Stanton. Another question from Christy. Christy asks, Jesus is addressed as rabbi in the gospel accounts. Did he receive training to do so, or did they just call him a rabbi because of his wisdom of scripture paired with great signs and wonders? Well, I mean, that's, that's a good question as well, Christy. Um, how much education did Jesus get, you know, in the village of Nazareth, maybe in the town of uh, Sepphoris? Most likely he was educated by his family, by his parents, relatives. Maybe there was a village teacher in Nazareth. You know, we really do not understand too much about village education in ancient Galilee, but he would have pre presumably been taught something. Uh, there are debates about precisely how literate Jesus was. You can read a whole book by Chris Keith on that topic. Uh, was he formally trained in uh, rabbinic teaching and in instruction? Now, that's a little bit de debated, again, because a lot of the sort of rabbinic stuff really comes post-70 and post-135 ideas, so the idea of rabbinic Judaism, but it does have continuity with the Pharisees in, in some sense, and there was a kind of uh, religious instruction that went on, and you know, if you went to the synagogue or whatever sort of village meeting places you have, or you make trips down to Jerusalem to the temple, you know, you, you learn you learn about your native religion, you learn about your ancestral customs, you learn about the law, and you learn about different ways of interpreting the law. So I, I think Jesus would have had at least a rudimentary instruction in the Torah, in the law, and he probably knew what the big debates were about interpretation of the law. And, and when we get them in the Gospels, like, you know, when is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What about, you know, making a gift to the temple rather than, you know, paying some money to look after your parents. Um, but Jesus was certainly praised as a figure with a, a very strong sense of authority. He certainly knew how to teach. Uh, he was a charismatic figure in terms of his instruction, and it made a lot of other respected uh, adversarial teachers even take note. And when they tried to kind of put him in his place, it was usually them who came off second best. So he was definitely a rabbi. Okay, from Malcolm, uh, he says, this is pro probably isn't Christology, but could you talk about the terms Reformed and Calvinist and how would you use them? Yeah, those terms can get used a little bit differently, uh, depending what context you're in. Uh, sometimes Reformed in pop popular circles means more like the five points of Calvinism. You know, uh, total depravity, unlimited, uh, unconditional grace, limited atonement, irresistible grace, uh, perseverance of the saints, um, which is more of the councils of Dord than, that, that, than anything else. I, I wouldn't really call it Calvinism or even Reformed. Reformed, you could argue, just means, you know, not Catholic. And it represents one of the various denominations that's um, split off from the Protestant Reformation. I mean, ca Calvinism can, can mean all sorts of things. I mean, if you take the Institutes of John Calvin as the definition of Calvinism, uh, it's, more, it's far more than a system of salvation. Uh, it, in, it includes a whole way of running a church. It, it includes even, even directions on how to run a Protestant city. So if you want to talk about Calvinism, it's not just a scheme of salvation with a big emphasis on predestination. It's how to run a church. It's how to run a city. I mean, that's really what Calvinism is, if you ask me. Now, I do identify as a Calvinist because I, I, I think the Calvinistic soteri soteriological scheme, their scheme of salvation is basically correct. But I have a fairly stock an standard answer that I tend to give. I say, look, you know, th this is Calvinism, you know, um, people suck. They suck in their sins. They are sucking us unto death. And the God who is rich in mercy saves them. That is Calvinism. The rest is commentary. Well, the commentary includes some significant bits like how to run a church and how to run a city, but you get the idea. Okay, another question from Gabe. Gabe asks, on the life and teachings of Jesus with that regard to the epistles, what conclusions could we draw on Jesus' view of gender roles? Is there a risky venture doing such an analysis as it could undermine the rest of scriptural authority? Well, that is a good question. What did Jesus believe about gender? Well, obviously, Jesus believed all the things about gender that we believe now. He obviously was exactly one of us. So he held 
the views of a 21st century egalitarian evangelical Christian just like me. That's what the temptation is always to say. There's always the temptation to create Jesus in your own image. Uh, Jesus did appear to have a very uh, open and inclusive view of women. And that's not to say that all other Jews or all our religions were necessarily exclusive and patriarchal. I mean, you know, it was, it was different. But Jesus speaks into a patriarchal society. Uh, he seems to, in some cases, you know, share some of the, the presuppositions that there are, there, are, there are men, there are wives, they have children, uh, you, know, you know, women tend to serve in, in the household. Um, you know, he, he's, he, he's not cruising around Galilee and Jerusalem, you know, trying to be a first wave feminist. But, but he's, he is very open to, to women. He's financially supported by women in his ministry, read Luke 8 2. He's got some great things to say about women, uh, particularly their faith, particularly supplicants of healing, like the, the woman with the flow of blood who touched him. Uh, you've got the, you know, astounding encounter with Jesus and the Syrophoenician or the Canaanite woman. That's quite remarkable. You've got the woman at the well in uh, Samaria, which is quite a very revealing interaction of Jesus's view of women. So we've got to remember that Jesus is speaking into his context um, out of the assumptions and presuppositions of that world. And we've got to be cautious about, you know, creating Jesus's view of something in a way that neatly corresponds with everything we believe and we would like him to believe, okay? Like I said, it'd be good if Jesus went around trying to find, uh, trying to found the first university just for women or something like that, but we've got to accept that Jesus, uh, at least in his humanity, is, is a product of his time. He's talking, teaching with people who have a certain presupposition of the world, of family, of all sorts of things. So yeah, it's a little bit of a mixed answer I'm giving there. But that's, that's I believe, all the questions for this time round. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sending them to me. They were, they were some doozies. They were some very, very good questions. Thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully in a couple of months, I'll put out another uh, invitation to send me questions. And I look earnestly forward to some, to some more of the good questions that you come up with. So until next time, thank you very much and God bless you.